Well, good morning, church. I feel like, I feel at home already. You guys, are we like a down-home church? Like, no, I mean, Pink Floyd's been referenced already by your pastor. I feel like I can, I'm, like, this is smooth sailing from here on out. Like, we got that out of the way, and we're good to go. <laughs> now, my name is Andrew Royer, and uh, married for 23 years and have three boys uh, who are at college and high school age, and uh, it's a, a privilege to serve at, at EBI. And you guys have received some of our students, and you support some of our graduates who are now missionaries. And so we have just thank you for your connection and your partnership with us. Um, your pastor has come and visited us. He, he sends me books that he thinks I need to read. Um, one time he came to an event and he saw a janky podium that I was using and he sent me a new one. It's just like, um, you guys have been, you have encouraged me without even knowing it. Your reputation has, has gone before you as a church who loves God's word. And, and so it's a privilege to be here today. Um, I'd like to open up uh, a passage. We're going to look at, we're eventually going to get to um, Acts chapter 8. And before we get there, we really have to back up a bit to understand that passage. To really understand its context, we're going to have to look back a little bit and get a running start to get up to Acts chapter 8. So I promise we will get to Acts chapter 8 eventually, but I want to back up to the beginning of chapter of, of the book of Acts so that we can see the context that led up to chapter 8. In fact, we're going to book back up so far into the book of Acts, we're going to trip into its prequel. Now, hold on just a second. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, that's right. And what else did Luke write? Oh, man, that was an easy one. That was, that was low-hanging fruit on that one, right? That's right. In fact, it's kind of like a two-volume set, the book of Luke and then the book of Acts. The book of Luke details the life of Jesus and his ministry all the way up till the end. And then the book of Acts picks up where the story left off with the apostles and what happens there, particularly Peter and then Paul and the development of the church. So you have to think of it as book one and book two. So if we're going to look at Acts 8, we're backing up to the beginning of Acts and we actually have to trip into the end of Luke to really catch the context. So Go with me to the end of chapter, or to chapter 24, the end of the book of Luke, which is book one in this two-book series, all right? So we'll follow that through from chapter 24. Uh, this is where we're at. Jesus had come, he had lived his life, he had lived his ministry, and he died. This is where chapter 24 picks up. His disciples I mean, just, just picture this for a little bit. Like Jesus had gone out and he found his disciples and he says, come and follow me. And they were pretty excited about who this might be. Is he Messiah? Is he going to free us from the oppressors that they had experienced up until this point? And so they start to follow him and his teachings are more, more authoritative than they ever imagined. And this is exciting. And, and he taught as if he was had authority over the law. And this was amazing. And then they make their way through the countryside over the course of a few years in all of these little towns and eventually gets to Jerusalem. And the people of Jerusalem are like, Hosanna. They're, they're like waving him in as maybe this new king. And it's exciting and it's thrilling. And then he dies. It's like, wait a second. This did not go the way we had planned on it. I mean, this... This is a little anticlimactic, right? This is like maybe disappointing at best, confusing, a bit of turmoil. And chapter 24, if we read the whole thing, you'll see the disciples left Jerusalem out to a little, a little town not far away, about a, just a few hours walk out in the little town named Emmaus. And Jesus came in and was walking with them. That was normal to walk in groups. It's a little safer out in the country that way. And Jesus is walking with them, and he says, what's going on? And they said, where have you been, under a rock or something? Have you not seen, have you not heard what happened? Everybody in the whole town's talking about Jesus and how he killed him. And they start talking, and he starts to explain, using the scriptures, the prophets and the Psalms, he uses the whole Old Testament uh, to explain to them 
that Messiah had to suffer and die. That's, that's chapter 24. And he get to the, they get to the town, and they say, why don't you come in? And he says, no. And then he said, they say, you should. It's at the end of the day. And so he comes in, and then all of a sudden, they understand who he is. They see him, and they realize it. And, they're, and, and he, then he disappears from them. And their hearts are like, whoa, didn't our hearts burn as he talked and explained the scriptures? And this is kind of this exciting moment. And so they rush back to town because they want to tell everybody that they saw him. And this is this exciting moment. And this sort of accumulates as Jesus appears to them one more time. And he says, peace be to you. And they're startled and they're frightened. And they're like, is this a spirit? Is this not? And doubts arise in their heart and all of these things. And he shows his hands and his feet and he has them touch him to see like, I'm a a real person. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like this and they're okay with this. And they finally have joy and they're marveling. I'm fast forwarding this, that he eats some fish with them. I guess that's proof because ghosts apparently don't eat fish. I don't know if they don't like fish. I think it's because they can't eat. But um, this is where we get to the point again, verse 44. So follow with me. Then he says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that and everything was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he uses the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, basically the entire Old Testament, to explain this is what had to happen. Like this was... This was the plan. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And he made sense of the turmoil that they're in and why this had to happen. And look at verse 47. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all ethnos or nations, to all people groups beginning in Jerusalem. And now he he explained to them and made sense of what happened because that was a bit confusing. And then he makes sense of what's going to happen. He says, this had to happen. And now this is what has to happen. This message did you see a twofold message in there? What was the first half of that? What needs to be proclaimed? The first thing? Repentance. And that's what we do, right? We, we repent. Those who are against Jesus, those who are opposed to Jesus, repent of their opposition and their rebellion. And what's the second half of that message? Yep. For repentance and forgiveness. That's what God does. What we do is repent, and what God does is forgive. That's, just, that's what the, he's summarizing the gospel. We repent, he forgives, right? And he says, this message is going to be proclaimed to all the nations starting in Jerusalem, starting where they were at. Now, remember, they're not from Jerusalem. This is not their hometown. They are outsiders. They're from Galilee. In fact, several times already, their, even their accent was the wrong accent. Right? They're like, oh, I can tell you're Galilean by the way you talk. Because they are country bumpkins from up, up near Galilee, and now they're down in the big city, and people can spot them in a crowd. Ah, you guys are Galilean. So they're in a hostile environment somewhat. They killed their leader just a days ago. They'd killed Jesus. So now they're in this dangerous city, dangerous for them, and they're not at home. But this is where the gospel needs to start. Start in Jerusalem. All right, so that's the end of Luke. And then Jesus goes on to heaven. He ascends there. Now skip over to Acts chapter 1. And if you're reading Acts chapter 1, you can skim your eyes up at the beginning, verse 1. You'll see that the author, Luke, he, he makes sense that, like, this is my continuation. In my first book, which was Luke, um, I dealt with all of Jesus' teachings until he was taken up and the commands that he gave through the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, and now this is what I'm going to explain to you. 
Um, and verse four, he explains to them he had that Jesus had ordered them to stay in Jerusalem. Now remember, they're not they're not from Jerusalem. This is not their hometown. They are outsiders in this big city, the biggest city around, and it's a dangerous place to be. But he says you need to stay here because something's going to happen. You need to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So at some point, they came, um, when they came together, they asked him, this is verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Oh, this is a great question. Like, I mean, you know, like Jesus had come and then he, he died and we thought we were moving toward this direction and then it sort of got derailed by his death. But maybe now that he's risen from the dead, maybe there's hope filling their heart. And so they ask him, this is their expectation that he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Like it's been oppressed by the Romans for a long time. You know, their worship is uh, somewhat mitigated and delegated and became political and it's just a mess and their hope is that now Jesus is going to clear this up and of course verse 7 Jesus does one of his non-answer answers I love that about Jesus people ask him questions and then he like totally doesn't answer it he answers with a question sometimes um this is what he says he says oh, I'm not going to tell you that Well, he didn't quite say it that way. He said it like this. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But, and this is where he switches, and he does explain, he does help them. He does help them understand what's about to take place. And this is verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is his explanation of what's going to take place. You're going to be my witnesses. And really, um, I I see this as probably Jesus explaining what's going to happen and maybe even prophesying this is how it's going to roll out. Uh, so it's instructions, and it's also, this is what's going to happen. And then, and then he leaves them. Can we pick that apart? Let's identify the things that Jesus told them that are going to happen. You're going to, number one, what? Receive power. That's right, you can say it out loud. Um, and when's that going to happen? The second one? The Holy Spirit comes. So chronologically, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and you'll receive power. But he said it backwards. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you're going to what? What's the next one? Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, specifically. And then, my witnesses where? Judea, and then Samaria, and then ends of the earth. The uttermost parts of the earth, maybe your translation says. So, kind of a six-fold explanation of that message. Remember, he had already told them this message of repentance and forgiveness of sin needs to be proclaimed to all of the nations. Right? He said that at the end of book one, the end of Luke. This is what Jesus had told them. This is what needs to happen. And now he's saying it's going to start in Jerusalem and it's going to spread to Judea and to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Well, not much time passes and you get into chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit didn't exist beforehand or that he wasn't working beforehand. In fact, if you were to go back and read the Old Testament looking for the work of the Spirit, you would find that the Spirit was well at work throughout all of the Old Testament. He was empowering uh, God's people to do God's work. Many times it was to a king or to a prophet or to someone to lead battle, whatever it was that was accomplishing God's mission, God's Spirit was there empowering people to obey God and to lead the way. But it wasn't for everybody, and it wasn't permanent, right? It was, in fact, Moses comes out, and people are a little bit jealous that he 
had had this encounter with the Lord and he had prophesied. And he's like, man, I wish that all of you were able to do this. Right? So he recognizes not everybody receives the Holy Spirit. David received the Holy Spirit in special ways. So people received the Holy Spirit to write down Scripture or to give messages from God. But it was a special and unique moment. And now, now the Holy Spirit is coming on everyone, on all believers. When you believe, the Holy Spirit indwells us permanently for the rest of our lives. So this is what happens. The Spirit comes and prophecy fulfilled and God's mission advances. Chapter 2, Jesus says, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you. And it happened. Chapter 2 of Acts, it happens. They receive the Holy Spirit and they receive power. Now, the power part, um, man, don't, don't be too distracted by that. Yes, the apostles did some interesting miracles in those early days. Some, some amazing things. It sort of verified that this was really God and not just some hokey thing. Right? In fact, some amazing uh, miracles are described in those early books of Acts, and you can read them and, and be amazed. And, and, but we don't see that as the normal for the rest of the New Testament. It's not like believers are walking around with these, with these miracles left and right like we see at the beginning of the book of Acts. But there are some other things that happen that are really quite amazing that we do see the rest of the New Testament do. And that, I, let me just zoom in to Acts 2, verse 17. This is maybe where I first start to see, notice this. So there's a guy in here, Peter. You guys know Peter, one of the disciples. And he's preaching, and this is, he sees the Holy Spirit come on. And look at verse 17. And Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And he starts to preach. And he starts to explain God's word. And he starts to explain what's happening to them. And he starts to explain how the, the scriptures had testify. And he starts to preach through Joel. And he starts to preach through Psalm 16. And he starts to explain. And by the time he gets to verse 22, he is rolling. I mean, he is preaching about Christ. And he gets to um, lead down through here for the rest of the chapter. And you'll find Peter getting bold. You get to verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he starts to lay it out there. This is the guy that a few days ago, maybe 40 days ago, 30-some days ago, you remember him? The night Jesus was betrayed? You remember him around the fire? And people saying, hey, you're the guy, aren't you? You're a Galilean. I can tell by your accent. You're one of Jesus' followers. And what did Peter say? No, it wasn't me. Like like a little girl on a tricycle with pigtails, he runs away from that whole thing. He is is not bold. He's not courageous. What happened to Peter that now he's like standing up in Jerusalem preaching? The Holy Spirit empowered him. I mean, he is laying it out there. And so much so, it starts to become a spectacle. Um, Hundreds of people begin to follow the Lord. Thousands of people begin to follow the Lord. Thousands. In fact, that day, about 3,000 souls were added to the, as the church is being born. (laughs) It's amazing. Um, And people are starting to gather, and they're being saved, and they're hearing God's word. And um, Peter gets arrested in chapter 4, and he goes before a council. And it's interesting, the council of people that he's before, the text makes it pretty clear who's there. In fact, if you look at chapter 4, around verse 18 or so, verse 17, actually, we'd have to back up a little bit before that. We see the rulers and the elders, they all get together, verse 6 Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, 
The reason why John's writing these names down is because he wants to understand these are the guys who killed Jesus less than a month ago or about a month ago. right? Caiaphas was the high priest at the time. Uh, Annas was his father-in-law who was probably calling the shots still. And his five sons had been were high priests eventually. So this is a powerful family. And here he is just a couple weeks later facing the people who killed Jesus. And Peter's not backing down. He's like, I'll tell you about Jesus. And he lays it out there. He's like, there's no other name that people can be saved by. And it's like, whoa, that's that triggering flags for any Jewish person because there's one name and, and its name wasn't Jesus in their mind. He's saying there's no other name by which given by which man might be saved. And they say you shouldn't preach. And he says, well, this is what I've got to do. And they release him. And here's a little, here's a little interesting note. Um, follow down in chapter 14, or chapter 4, sorry, down to verse 18, or 16. They, they have to have a little conference. Well, let's back up verse 13, just because we're here. Verse 13, sorry. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. It was cool. Peter didn't become articulate. He didn't become seminary trained. He didn't suddenly like flow out like a master preacher. In fact, they're like, yeah, this guy is uneducated. <laughs> this guy is common. Peter was working class, and he, he stayed working class. Like, he didn't all of a sudden change his abilities. It's not like he got the Spirit, and now, now he could preach like he never could before. All, all he got the ability was the boldness, like the inappropriate boldness <laughs> to preach to these the most educated elite people of the city. He, he just all of a sudden had a boldness to do it. And what was impressive was not that he was articulate. In fact, it makes the point to say they were not. In fact, it makes a point to say that they're pretty common. But the boldness was striking to people. It was striking. Because now they have the Holy Spirit. You will receive power now that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, first of all, where? In Jerusalem. So if you follow this through, the council's not sure what to do. They excuse these people out. And now they're talking. They're like, man, they performed a miracle. And this is what they say in verse 16. It is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. A little detail that Luke throws in here for us to see. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Here it is. All the inhabitants of Jerusalem have heard about this. All of them. So if we're backing up, you'll receive power. Check. After the Holy Spirit comes on you, check. In Jerusalem, thank you, check. You'll receive power in Jerusalem, check. This is what happens. Before before I go on, like this is just, this is the theme. The miracles, not necessarily the theme that we see the rest of the Bible, but the theme of boldness, this is what we see. And it's not just, it's not just the 12 apostles. In fact, they, they start to be called the 12 or the apostles, and other believers are called disciples, they're called believers, they're called members of the way, they're called eventually the church, like all of those different things. And we start to see different people, and it's not just the 12 that we start to see preaching. In fact, pretty soon we see them gather a group of men together, Uh, full of wisdom and the Spirit, and they start to help out in the ministry. Some of them in there were like Stephen and Philip and other people. And we see them being bold and sharing the gospel, and we just see boldness over and over and over. That's the part we see. That's the the empowerment that we see from here on out. Uh, We see them encourage, like courage to face arrest, the courage to the next day keep going. Um, Chapter 5, verse 27, you see the power to obey, the courage to have a different position, the courage in chapter 6 and 7 for Stephen um, to stand up and just deliver an amazing speech. 
the power, chapter 7, verse 54, to face death, the power and courage to face prison, the courage to lose everything. Here's the thing, you guys. If you are a believer, you have God's Spirit in you. The same Spirit that Peter had. The same one. And, and search for an excuse for you not to share the gospel or be a witness. And, and Peter had them all. Well, I could lose something. Check, Peter had that. Well, I'm not trained. Well, Peter, Peter was not seminary trained either. He wasn't. He had a good teacher, and you have a good teacher. And you have God's word. And you have the same spirit that Peter had. And guys, the Spirit can enable you to be to have an obedient life. The Spirit can enable you to be a witness to your family, to your kids and grandkids, to disciple your children and raise them in the Lord, to be a witness to your extended family. And I know that gets dicey. I have extended family. It gets dicey. Um... You can be a witness in your neighborhood, to your neighbors, in your workplace. Can that get dicey? It can get dicey. It can get iffy. But God's Spirit can enable us to do that. All right, let's keep rolling here. So Judea and Samaria are the next ones, right? Well, Judea is kind of the surrounding area around Jerusalem. It's probably referring to the places where the Jews live in that surrounding region. And Samaria is really kind of overlapping with Judea, but it's referring to non-Jewish people who lived near in the surrounding settlements in a particular region surrounding Jerusalem. So it's not like Judea and Samaria are necessarily further than each other. It's not like you had to go through Judea to get Samaria. It's like there are these surrounding regions around Jerusalem, but ethnically they had a different heritage and they had a, a little different belief system. They're like distant cousins, ethnically speaking. But um, that was kind of the surrounding areas, is Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And here's what's interesting. This is what I want to share with you guys. Chapter 8. So the end of chapter 7, we see Stephen die, and this is the first martyr. Um, And we get to chapter 8, verse 1. So I know, I'm finally here. (laughs) And Saul approved of his execution of Stephen's. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Now here they're already being called the church, right? The the gathered believers. So a great persecution breaks out against them. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Except the apostles. Now just... Pay attention to the details here. Who gets scattered throughout Judea and Samaria? The church. That's right. Can we just say the church? Um, Who stays in Jerusalem? The apostles. The twelve. They stay in Jerusalem. Who's scattered? The church. All right. So just to make sure that detail is clear. Hold on. I know it's getting... Like tiring, but just go with me one more time. Who's scattered throughout Judea and Samaria? The church. Who's not scattered? Who stays in Jerusalem? All right, now watch this next passage. So devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, and he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4, now those who were scattered, who was scattered? The church. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Who went about preaching the word? Not the apostles. The apostles were back in Jerusalem. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And we saw Peter stand up. We saw the 11 stand up and preach in Jerusalem. But who fulfills Jesus' prophecy 
about Judea and Samaria is who? Church. This great commission was not just for the disciples. It's for the church. Guys, sometimes, I I have the privilege of speaking in a lot of churches. None of them as dear as you guys. You guys are awesome. Um, And sometimes we act like, oh, ministry, preaching, that's for the preacher. We'll, We'll pay him to do it. And then we just be, you know, out. We just come in on Sundays or whatever. But that's not exactly the design and the intention. The intention is that he is here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You heard that before? Bet you have recently. That's right. He, that's his job is to equip you to be on mission in your area, in this town. Now, it says the last one. We didn't get to the last one. Well, what about that one? Um, well, they are witnesses. The church is scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, and they're preaching the word. And they're the ones fulfilling this. It's not the pros. It's not the, the, the original, the OG 12. Um, they, they're scattered throughout here. And God's prophecy is fulfilled and his mission's advancing. Well, what about the ends of the earth? Well, from their perspective, maybe that starts even in chapter 26, because pretty soon the next story, you meet somebody from Ethiopia, which would have been the upper Nile region of Africa, and it starts to advance all the way down to northern Africa as people are saved there. And then they send uh, missionaries all the way up into Greece, right, into Corinth and into um, Philippi and Ephesus and eventually all the way up into Rome and maybe even into Spain. And that's where the New Testament ends, right? So it's spreading out throughout all that whole Roman region, that Roman Empire. And we understand the disciples from history go down into North Africa and go east in as far as India. And that spread continues to happen. Eventually, somebody had the audacity to translate the scriptures into this new language called English. They kill them for it, but like it makes it there. And then that spreads throughout Europe and then bring it over to America and spreads throughout here. And it spreads throughout South America and throughout the rest of the world. And now every country in the world has a church. That's amazing. That really what couldn't have even been said as little as 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you couldn't have said that. There were, church, there were countries that had no zero churches. But now today, every country in the world has churches, but it's spreading not just to every country. We have to understand there's a difference between country and nation. Countries like the geopolitical borders, like some war happened, they drew a line, said, okay, this is a country, you're a country. And they're always changing and shifting, and one country takes over a little bit of the other country and draws a line differently, and that changes. And if you have an old map, you just all of a sudden see Sudan was one, and now it's two, and you see Ukraine and Russia, and you see these different countries that change the lines. Those are countries. But remember, Jesus has said this message needs to be preached to He didn't say the countries, he said the ethnic groups, the ethnos, the nations. And that's different. That hasn't been completed yet. In fact, about a third of the world's nations still haven't had the gospel. That's why we still bear this responsibility to send people to the nations where there's no gospel being proclaimed so that they might hear this message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And at the same time, we don't neglect this country. We don't neglect the next generation. The work you do with your children is important, discipling them. We can't neglect that to send people off to, you know, the middle of the jungle of South America. You can't neglect your neighborhoods and your workplaces and your extended family for the sake of some other place in Africa. It has to be both so that we don't lose the ground that we have here while we're gaining new ground somewhere else. That's why this church is important. That's why your work and your ministry here is important to this county and this neighborhoods, right? Um, What's that? We, We were the remotest part of the earth. And now if we're to survey 
the rest of the world, I think that that's what we would find is some of the low hanging fruit is, is there. Uh, the gospel's there. And now these unreached people groups are, man, some crowded cities in Asia. There are people living in deserts, people living in dense jungles and frozen wastelands and forbidden access and foreboding places, hard places to get to, hard places to stay, right? Difficult languages to learn. And mission seems to be now accelerating from everywhere to everywhere. I was a Bible teacher in Brazil teaching Brazilians who are going to tribes in Brazil, and they're also going to Africa and working with Africans who are going to North Africa. We have Brazilians going to Africa and Africans coming to, going to uh, Indonesia. It seems to be a crisscross of the world as we, it seems like it's accelerating, and still there's work to be done all over. And the church plays a part, and it's each person in the church plays a part. And you play a part in this great commission because it's for you. Both here and to send and to train and to support and to pray for and to encourage the people that you've sent out as well. And look at Acts uh, 11. Just, Just take a peek at it. Verse 19. Acts 11, 19 says this. So the disciples determine everyone according to his own ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Uh, I love that little statement because after the gospel has gone out further, they send back and have care back towards the church. Um, And I read the wrong passage. There's also... (laughs) No, yeah, that's the end. Um, Back up just a second. Those who were being scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists and also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was on them and a great number who believed and turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And he goes there and he's able to teach and build into them. And then they end up sending people back and interacting and engaging, having fellowship back toward Jerusalem when they had a hard time. Hey, it's been a privilege being with you this morning. If I could just encourage you in that, this commission, don't think, oh, that's for the missionaries. That's for the people we sent to Togo or Apinaje or wherever. Um, you, this commission is for you. You have the same Holy Spirit and you have God's word and you have shepherds to teach you and train you and prepare you and guide you. And this work is for your family, it's for your neighborhood, it's for all who need Christ, and it's also for the ends of the earth. All right, I'm gonna gonna pray and wrap up our time. Lord, I thank you for the witness that this church is to this region. I thank you for the faithfulness that they've had eagerly to read your word and study it and understand it. I thank you for the faithfulness that they've had in inviting people and bringing people in and sharing the gospel and teaching their children in the Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the witness that they've been and for the sending of missionaries far as well as maintaining a a witness here. Lord, I pray that that would only abound. I pray for every man and woman and kid here in this room that they would understand that this mission is for them to take place in. That they're invited to participate. They're commanded to participate. I pray, Lord, that this gospel work would abound in this area and that many more would come to know you as their Savior. 
repent from their rebellion against you, from their sins, and be saved. I pray that they would be able to send their own people to the ends of the earth that those who don't have a chance to hear would be able to hear. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.